and welcome to the July 24th episode of the Firearms Talk Forums podcast. And um, it is good to be back with you folks in uh, Internet land and uh, everybody on the website and those people who listen to us on iTunes. Thank you again for listening as well. Uh, we are always happy to be here and bring you the news of the day. Uh, in uh, the Second Amendment and uh, Bill of Rights community, as well as other stuff going on in the wide world of rights denial. Uh, that, that's the that's the new thing I like to call it now, rights denial. And um, I picked that up from uh, I picked that up from a Massachusetts blogger uh, earlier in the week. He doesn't call it the the uh, he calls it the rights denial blog. And I said, okay, I think I can look at that. Um, of course, uh, our disclaimer: you cannot record this uh, without proper pre-record this without proper permission of the Firearm Stock Forums or the parent company group, Group Builder Inc. Okay, unless you receive this through the website or through iTunes, you cannot hold any of us responsible for anything we say on here legally. Okay, because uh, we have our rights as well. So I just wanted to make sure that we got that out. And uh, let me introduce my co-host, as usual, uh, my vaunted crew, and of course the original, the one and only, the Viking Dad. How are you this evening, my friend? Uh, doing relatively well, Dr. Paul. It's been uh, heating up around here uh, in more ways than just uh, in the weather. Uh, did have a, a nice exchange with a local here. Um, there's been a conversation on one of the lo local forums or local uh, Yahoo groups uh, regarding uh, the neighbor's shooting uh, with the called big, uh, large caliber firearms uh, at every day in the evenings. And uh, this this person who's obviously um, not enjoying the the noise in their neighborhood. Uh, has asked what they can do about it, and I was rather gratified to see quite a few Second Amendment uh, wary or Second Amendment aware uh, individuals chiming in, myself included. Uh, and uh, I had made the offer, and I would be more than happy to, to uh, speak with the people, uh, hopefully mitigate the situation, and perhaps get this person who's complaining about the noise uh, into shooting, or at least uh, give her the opportunity to introduce her. Um, so that's moving forward, and I did get one new listener uh, out of the exchange. Excellent. Uh, he's been listening to our podcast, and uh, hopefully we'll have a new member on our talk forum here uh, soon as well. So anyhow, that's today in a nutshell. Great. And uh, let me get to our other co-host. He is a little further back east than we are. Uh, we will welcome in the moderator, uh, one of the moderators on the site, uh, part of our crew, uh, Tech Greg, otherwise known as Greg. Greg, how are you tonight? Very good, Bill. And uh, I'd just like to um, offer some uh, assistance on uh, Mrs. Dad's problem. Um, she could always uh, volunteer to uh, get all the shooters suppressors, and that way no one has to uh, interfere with anybody. <laughs> Alas, like that. that was suggested by another uh, participant <laughs> in the conversation. Um, but, of course, we would have to have uh, suppressors legalized in California. Currently, uh, private ownership of suppressors uh, is illegal uh, in the state of California. There are only, I, I believe it's 38 states uh, that yeah. allow private ownership of uh, suppressors. And, of course, I brought up the cost involved, $200 tax stamp for each and every one, um, and the fact that you had to go through exactly the same qualifications and, and uh, background checks as you do for a firearm. Um, that did not get a lot of response. As a matter of fact, I don't believe anybody responded correctly to that, those points. Um, however, it was brought up, suppressors were brought up, and, you know, for whatever it's worth. But I appreciate you try. Um, and you know what, we're going to get more in. We're going to get more into that um, further down in the summer because uh, we have a guest with us tonight. We were going to have two guests. I don't know where the other one is, but, um, you know, it, it's really a pleasure to have Darren Wolf with us. Um, Darren has a blog in, out of Pennsylvania, and uh, I saw a video that somebody posted uh, with him um, waxing, I would say more than poetic, but uh, the waxing legal and uh, – uh, waning about rights and uh, of our waning rights, and uh, I think it's very important that uh, what Darren has to say. So he's agreed to join us tonight as a guest. Darren, how are you? And welcome to the podcast. I'm fine, and uh, thanks for having me on. 
How are you? Yeah, and uh, you know, I think it's really important uh, that you get your, you know, that you're able to get your point out uh, to folks, and um, you know, I'm glad you were able to come on with us, and uh, you know, I think we all have a bunch of questions for you, some that we uh, sent you, and some that we didn't. Um, but uh, I think you're uh, pretty up to snuff on what's going on here. And I think first we'd like to stay with you uh, in Pennsylvania before uh, Mike shows up and uh, we discuss uh, what's going on in New York. Um, but I appreciate you boning up on what's going on in, in New York as well. Um, okay. How did this get started? How did you get involved with, um, you know, with talking about the uh, Bill of Rights and, everything else that's uh, going on. How did you uh, become a political commentator? Well, I guess it started be by becoming a libertarian and understanding the importance of rights and how they protect us, as many people think they protect criminals, strangely, but, and just wanting to do something. And uh, it seemed like, uh, you know, blogging, uh, you know, the videos on YouTube, things like that, uh, were the way to go. Uh, at one time, I was an activist with the uh, Libertarian Party. Um, but, you know, when you're working with a uh, third party in a two-party system, I think that kind of says something about your chances. And yeah, we've been talking about that for quite a while, but uh, please continue. Okay, so um, anyways, uh, as uh, you know, for a while, it seems like for several years there, the, the gun issue was kind of, um, say, on the back burner. But in recent years, things started to heat up in that regard. And uh, that's when I uh, sort of shifted my attention to that um, more than anything else. Uh, and the more I studied the issue, the more I saw that the other side just doesn't know what it's talking about. Uh, Oh, by the way, I call them gun rights haters. You were talking about uh, mm -hmm. what we call them, rights deni deniers? Um, I call them rights denial activists. That's what rights I like to call denial them. activists. Yes, well, I call them gun rights haters. Um, and you could quote me on that. I'll be glad to let you quote me on that. <laughs> I will. When I, when, I put the, when I put the podcast up on my blog, I'll do that. Okay, good. Mm -hmm. All right, well, my co-hosts have some questions for you also. We're going to patch this around a little bit, and uh, I'm going to turn the mic over to Viking Dad. And uh, Viking Dad, you get, the first, uh, you get the first shot in here after me. Greg, sit tight. You'll be next. Go ahead. Sure. Okay, uh, real quick, first of all, uh, could you uh, state your URL so that we know so that our listeners can go to your blog and uh, access it to which you have to there? Yes, uh, the name of the blog is The International Libertarian. So it's, it's all one word, the international libertarian dot blogspot dot com. Okay, terrific. And uh, you know, go ahead and reference that myself here in a few minutes. Um, now, one of the things that I see as a not as a libertarian party member myself, uh, but as a libertarian uh, ideology, is people who don't understand libertarianism uh, often uh, equate it to liberalism probably because they can't get over the, the name, the liberal end of the, uh, the liberal part of the name, or the word liberal being in the name. Um, and uh, I find that to be a very difficult hurdle to overcome. Have you seen, or, or in your experience, do you know of any uh, ways to best overcome that hurdle? Well, first, I have to comment on, on the premise here. My experience is that, People will label us according to the part of the libertarian agenda that they disagree with. So, I mean, some people have said that I'm left of Lenin, you know, and some people say I'm, you know, uh, uh, ultra conservative. It's 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 weird. <laughs> so, um, you know, it, it it it's it's the strangest thing in the world. If sometimes the does, does that depend, like, oh, Darren? Does that depend on who you talk to and what day of the week it is? Who you talk to? Yes, um, that's for sure. I mean, if if I go to a to a a left wing uh, website or forum, oh, all of a sudden, oh, you're just another conservative. I don't know why you feel the libertarians are any different. And then I try to talk to conservatives, and it's like, oh, you're 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 progressive, liberal, you know, blah blah blah. I don't know. Um, it, but the point is to overcome that. Um, what I try to do is emphasize the non-aggression principle. Uh, as something that really, and try to explain to people that that's what really makes libertarianism. 
is the consistent application of the idea that it is wrong to initiate the use of force or the threat of force. Uh, it, that, and of course, if uh, the use of force, the initiation of force is wrong, then the right to self-defense, I think, is obvious. And I try to emphasize that, that that's what we're about. That's how we, we consistently apply those principles. That's what makes us libertarians. Right. You and I, I, I think I would add to that myself, um, at least in, in my experiences uh, here in California, is um, I will tell people that I am all for everybody being able to exercise their rights and have full freedoms uh, as long as until they run up against the rights and freedoms of others. When you get to the point where you start affecting the rights and freedoms of others, that's when there should be some sort of a restriction or pushback. Um, people should be allowed to uh, push back against um, others infringing upon their rights and freedoms. Would you not agree? Absolutely. And that goes back to the non-aggression principle because the way to uh, trample somebody else's rights is by force. If you don't use force on them, then you're not stopping people from exercising their rights. Very good. Greg, let's go to you. Yeah, uh, I, I, had a, um, I had it explained to me one time uh, as far as libertarianism goes, and they said that um, most people understand that conservative Republican types actually like um, big government. They, they want to keep things just the way they are. They just want to have control of it and move the agenda their way. Same with uh, Democrats that are more liberal. The libertarians are more of a self-responsibility uh, type. They believe in the state's rights and they believe in smaller, more effective uh, federal government the way it was originally meant to be. And I always liked thinking of it like that because it's a um, it, it gives a very defining role to each group. Would you say that comes close to correct? Uh, close, yes. Um, definitely. Uh, my, my view is, is that the distinction between liberals and conservatives, in, you know, the, the mainstream of liberalism and conservatism is sort of an artificial distinction uh, that both liberals and conservatives have basically adopted progressivism uh, as it would have been understood 100 years ago. Uh, think of it this way. Uh, Teddy Roosevelt was a Republican president, and then he went on to found the Progressive Party. He ran against Woodrow Wilson in 1912 on the Progressive Party ticket. Well, how different is a conservative today from Teddy Roosevelt of a hundred and some years ago? I say not very. So, well, um, with a couple of distinctions, I would say uh, uh, Teddy Roosevelt was um, above and beyond all other things a conservationist. He started the National Park System. He he was uh, very very uh, in tune to the importance of preserving uh, our, our natural wonders. Um, he was also uh, an avid hunter and uh, uh, quite an, an accomplished naturalist. Um, so I would say that there, there are some pretty stark differences between today's conservative and uh, the conservative or, or the Republican of Teddy Roosevelt's day. But I think that's also why we've come to this point where um, we have – more parties forming because the, the, the big two are not representing how people think in this era. And I would say to that the, the, the big two, the, the Republicans and Democrats, uh, they, once they get elected, once they get into office, they focus entirely on opposing whatever the party, the other party uh, stands for. They do not uh, represent the voters that put them into office, and the only time that they ever do uh, try to uh, pander to the voters is when election time comes around. Uh, That's right. And that, that is why the system is broken as it stands right now. Well, that sounds like the politician. I, the, my view is the politician's job is basically to manipulate the people. 
and to keep the people in line. And so that's they just do whatever they need. They say whatever they need to say, do whatever they need to do to keep us in line while they do the bidding of the special interests that are behind them. Mm-hmm. Pay their bills. That's, yes. that's the big issue. That's the big issue that um, are getting drawing people away from the two main parties and why we keep saying we need to go back to a multi-party system because this is just not working. But, um, you know, focusing a little more on, on the gun law situation, that's what we've been talking about the past couple of weeks. Um, Darren, how do you think things got so far off track to where they are today in 2014? from the 1980s, the 1960s, you know, you and I are about the same age, so is Greg. Uh, Viking Dad's a little younger than us, but um, mm-hmm. pretty pretty observant on what's going on uh, since uh, we've all been uh, walking Despite around. Despite my youth. Despite your youth. <laughs> <laughs> well, uh, I think there are a number of factors uh, one of them, which actually goes against what the, the gun rights haters say, is in, in so many ways the United States is actually a very peaceful place. There are some pockets where there is a violent crime problem, but then there are other – where most of the United States is as safe as any part of Europe. I know the town that I live in hasn't seen a murder in decades. You know, uh, So uh, I think that's part of it is that we're actually so safe that people say, well, why do we need guns? Uh, Another aspect would be, I think, the reliance uh, on the uh, the government, mostly through uh, law enforcement for protection. That um, the, the argument is made, of course, you know, well, you don't need a gun because we have the police, and I think a lot of people buy into that. Too many people. Yeah, I think a lot of people do, do buy into it, and you know, I think part of the reason is that, um, and we even talked about it today on the site. Some people are lazy. And we'll we'll talk about gun owners who are lazy in a minute or two, but people are just generally lazy. And if they can have someone else protecting them, they will. Now, uh, that brings a story to mind. You know, I grew up in a police and education household. My dad had been a substitute teacher, but he was a federal agent primarily. And my mom was an educator her whole career. Um, an art educator, as a matter of fact. She was a dance teacher and an actress and an acting teacher. And... Um, you know, I got a good foundation of everything. And, you know, my my parents were fair but strict. You know, and I think they did a really good job raising me. I don't think they did a very good job with my baby brother, uh, but I think they did a very good job with me and my sister and, and my middle brother. I think they worked very hard with because he was a disabled person. Uh, and uh, that's why I was so interested in helping them and how I got into the field originally. You know, getting getting to what we're talking about, uh, I think people are generally lazy, and if they can have somebody else do it for them, they will, uh, long before they pick up a, a hand, raise a hand and anger themselves. And uh, I think that is, uh, you know, one of the main keys to uh, why society is the way it is today. And uh, a lot of people will agree with me up to a point. They'll say, well, you're right, because people don't want to look to think they protect themselves or do anything to better themselves, but... The country, the country makes this country makes it easy for people to be slackers too, and uh, you know I don't know how we're going to solve that problem, and uh, this administration doesn't want the problem solved because to them, uh, using the cloud pivot strategy is going to make sure that uh, you know the Democrats continue to be in power and uh, there's nothing anybody can do about it, but they decide to replace the Constitution with emergency martial law. Oh boy. Well, uh, as far as uh, like using force or using violence is concerned, um, this, again, despite what the gun rights haters say, which is that you know there, there's all these crazies out there, the vast majority of peaceful people are very peaceful. They're not practiced using force or violence to protect themselves or, or to do anything with it. And so they don't. You know, it's not only laziness, but it's just an unfamiliarity with it. Like I said, the U.S. most of the U.S. is very safe. So, you know, when people aren't used to violence or or force, using force, and they're they're not practiced at it, they're not trained, and, of course, in in many places they're not armed, then what do you do? Well, you're going to default to, oh, well, they've got these policemen around here that have guns and are trained to arrest people and protect them. Um, 
personally, I think the laziness comes in in not understanding the issue. Um, and that's why a lot of people buy into the gun rights haters appeal to emotion. You know, it's like, you know, somebody got killed and you have the crying mother out there. And, you know, it's easy to it's easy to like, you know, we have to do something. It's a lot harder to read some books, you know, serious historical and criminological studies and really understand what's going on. That's, well, that's and, very true. Um, I, I have a good friend uh, who's he's actually one of my, my projects. He's a immigrant, recent immigrant from uh, France. Um, you know, got a green card and everything. Kind of recently he's working on his way uh, to citizenship. He's been an anti-gunner for a long time, uh, you know, stemming from his, his uh, boyhood in France and, and uh, his liberal uh, upbringing here locally, you know, Santa Cruz County. Uh, is is one of the more liberal, most liberal uh, counties in, in California, uh, which is saying something. And um, I, re- you know, I over the last year and a half, uh, have a friend of mine, a good friend of mine, shooting buddy of mine, and I have had him to the range and and uh, introduced him to firearms in a non-threatening manner, and he really enjoyed himself. So he's kind of coming over. He's he's starting to come around. Well, I had the uh, opportunity to meet his mother last Christmas. Um, who was visiting from France, had never been here before, uh, and really enjoyed sp- uh, speaking with her, you know, spent quite a lot of time talking to her all. And then a few months later, uh, this spring, uh, Karim had mentioned that uh, his mom is now considering coming here, moving here, because she doesn't feel safe in France. Mm-hmm. There's nothing, no private property, no private personal uh, items, Nothing is safe uh, in, in in she lives in a fairly uh, low crime considered low crime area. She still doesn't feel safe there. She would rather move here to the, the wild west, um, and and she feels more comfortable here. So uh, the concept of Europe is uh, at its very core safer than the United States. It can be false. It may be less gun crime. That is because fewer people have guns. There's more violent crime throughout Europe uh, than there is in the United States, except for maybe in some pockets like, say, Chicago or Washington, D.C., or areas where there is severe gun control. So I think that's another... Yes, uh, uh, New York York City area, uh, Long Island. yeah, that that I think is another concept that people are are a little take, bit unclear on. Taking off right. from that, yeah, taking off from that, um, Viking Dad, the um, I read an article that was written by a criminologist, and he wondered when everybody was throwing facts and figures around in the anti-gun debate, he wanted to know how accurate this was, and so he did a study of uh, crime in Europe and in the United States, also in South America and Canada. He wanted to get a wide-ranging view. And he said that one of the problems is in the way crime is reported. Mm -hmm. If we have a shooting here in America and somebody dies, it's either labeled homicide, suspicious death, um, I can't remember, there's one other. But it's categorized. Suicide is the other one. Okay, yeah, that's right. And the, but the point is, it's put in a category immediately. Now, if investigators find it different, they change that category when they find out what actually happened. But within hours, it's at the Department of Justice, but they label on it. In England, until the entire investigation is done, it doesn't get classified. And if the investigation turns up to be undetermined, I mean, they can't figure out who shot what with what, it doesn't get listed as any sort of crime. So when they say that there's a lower crime rate in England, it's not necessarily because there's less crime. If there's a different way of reporting it, it doesn't actually report all of the crimes. And so he said, you know, be careful when you're, you're matching these figures because they do not, it's not an apples to apples comparison. You're not getting the, the, the uh, inaccurate view of how this is done. And, Darren, I think you hit on a really important point about 
something I've always railed against is the zero tolerance policy that everybody seems to be big on these days. Mm-hmm. I think both Bill and I came from the era when the bully kicked on you for a few days or a week, and then you finally just snapped and beat him up, much like in a Christmas story. <laughs> and um, that was always, you did everything wrong. And when the situation happened again, you were a little bit deeper, you handled things differently, but it could still include violence. It's hard for kids to understand that there's a time to use violence when they grow up in an environment where if they make a gun symbol with their fingers, they are suspended or expelled from school. They are made to believe that there is never a time for violence. There's never a time to protect yourself. And unfortunately, that is is exactly what Darren was saying about they're they're untrained. They have no they have no idea how to handle it. And, uh, yeah, and I want I just want to add side. one thing to this. I just want to add. You're right, Greg. I just want to add one thing to this real quick before we get back to Darren. Um, yeah. You know, I get a lot of um, I get a lot of email magazines, uh, a lot of different areas, and um, I guess part of because of my my faith uh, being Jewish, I read a lot of. Uh, Jewish stuff as well, and one of the uh, uh, Jewish online magazines that I read uh, last week, there was an attack by um, Arab youth in Paris, France, on a Paris synagogue, and they had the the seniors there in fear until the youth in the congregation stood up and defended their elders and drove the Arab sympathizers and French living Arabs out of the area and you will not see in any American paper on any American website that the Jews defended themselves. You'll you'll hear about a clash between Hamas youth in France and Orthodox Jews and you'll see in the papers that, you know, they'll make it seem like the Jews started it when all the Jews ever wanted to do is live in peace. So you know, I don't know. I, I don't know how uh, people sit on that. Um, I'm going to give it to Viking Dad, and then we're going to go back to Darren. Go ahead. Uh, two things that, that uh, came to mind. One was uh, there's, there's a terrific uh, blogger, video blogger, Kelly uh, uh, Johnson, who has a website, Meets uh, the Noise, and uh, he also uh, blogs for the NRA. He's got a terrific uh, blog. You can get it on YouTube uh, regarding uh, keep your own statistics. Uh, so if you you uh, search uh, YouTube for uh, mixed noise with your own statistics, uh, some really great information there, some great material there that uh, everybody can use. Yep. Um, and then also, the, I read a quote uh, from Bill of My Air. Um, I mean, from when she was uh, uh, Prime Minister of Israel, and she, there was a quote there that, about um, how the uh, – Israelis are horrified that the uh, uh, Palestinians are killing their own children in an effort to kill Israelis and or to, to, in an effort to kill Jews, um, and they will continue to be horrified by that until it stops. And that is not that was, you know, what uh, boy, she died in '78. That was probably early '70s. Uh, late 60s when she said that. And uh, nothing has changed in the last 40 years. Um, that, that still stands today. Hmm. Go ahead, Darren. Well, so, um, go ahead, Darren. Um, about the U.K., one of my favorite subjects. Um, uh, along the lines of, of um, how they report murders, I understood that they don't actually classify something as a murder until somebody is tried and convicted of that murder. Um, right. So basically, so, uh, that which, and then one guy put together some statistics. And I kind of forget where I read this on the, uh, but he said that if you if you actually compare apples to apples, the UK has maybe half the murder rate of the US, not you know some tiny fraction of it. Um, uh, I think to some degree, uh, moving on to the other subject of uh, people using force, um, and. Um, you know they're trying. We're trying. It seems like they're trying to train the kids in the idea that there's never a time to use violence. Uh, it it um, reminds me of 
the a debate that was going on in the 60s between in the, during the civil with the civil rights movement where you had people like Martin Luther King who were about you know strict nonviolence but and then something that is rather ignored today is the other side of the civil rights movement which was about armed self defense and groups like the uh, Deacons for Defense and Justice for example they get swept under the rug despite the fact that in many ways they were more effective than some other parts of it but the point being the uh, the advocates of armed self defense are saying that nonviolence is really teaching people just to to to, to submit and to 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 take things when uh, to take abuse when they shouldn't and sometimes i think that's what the the government is really getting at is that they want to teach us to to be submissive and to, to the government uh, and not stand up for our, our rights yeah, that's a very good point. Population. Yeah, that's a very good point, and uh, you know, I, a lot of people, a lot of people do see it that way, but I think more people don't see it that way, and I think that's what the problem is. And that leads us to question two. And um, right after I give this question, we're going to take a, a break because we're coming up on the uh, midway point. You know, what can we do as a minority? currently, because that's what we are currently, a minority, to elevate the consciousness of our rights being taken away. And I want to pause right now because I'm going to do a very quick uh, sh uh, short break and show ID. Of course, you're listening to the Firearms Talk Forums podcast hosted by Dr. Football, myself, Dr. Bill, and co-hosted by Viking Dad and Tech Greg. And, uh, you know, again, uh, we thank you all for listening. And uh, that's our short ID for the uh, halftime, so to speak. So we have very quick halftime here. Um, Darren, I'm going to let you take this one first, and then we'll all pitch in behind you. But what can we do as, as a minority group to elevate consciousness of rights being taken away? How do we, how do we stand up to this? I would say that the major thing that we can do, and I'm talking about the, the average person out there, is just get up and speak, uh, whether it's letter to the editor, uh, you know, go to that march uh, where we're at that rally, where we're, uh, you know, standing up for our rights or we're counter-rallying a uh, gun rights haters rally or something like that. Just get up there, you know, you start a blog, uh, put comments on articles. I think that's an excellent way that somebody who doesn't ha only has limited time Put a few comments on there. When they put up an article somewhere that's, that's blasting guns and gun rights, so put that put that comment in there and knock it knock it down. Um, to me, those are the things that the, the the average person out there can get up and do. And if we can get more people doing that, I think that would make a big difference. Yeah, I have to agree, Viking. Yeah, um, I would I would uh, agree with that. Um, but always use discretion and uh, never uh, take the or, or if you ever do take the uh, uh, stance that might become uh, might feel threatening to the audience that you're addressing, um, do that cautiously uh, because fear is a very powerful motivator and it motivates these people these these uh, gun rights haters. Uh, to uh, double up their efforts, redouble their efforts in uh, banning our rights or, or restricting our rights, um, your efforts in trying to sway them has swayed them the wrong way. So you have to be very careful in doing that. Um, that, uh, I, I think, is one of the more important things that I would say we can do. Uh, but, yes, being vocal, being uh, respectful, uh, getting your, your word out there, getting your beliefs out there, and uh, getting people to understand that, hey, we're not the, the big bad bullies that they think that we are. Uh, we are a true minority. Um, and in that minority, or I'm sorry, uh, as a minority, it is actually their duty to help protect us and our rights in very, the very same way that the civil rights movement was protecting or uh, demanding uh, equal rights for a minority, the, the uh, black people of the United States, um, you know, it, it, that movement would not have uh, been successful had it not been for them winning the hearts and minds of the majority of the United States. Um, and you know, thank God that they were able to. I mean, that's, that was a, a huge 
achievement on their behalf. But now we're in the same place, uh, not for the same reasons. We, not, we don't have the same challenges that we do as a, as a people, uh, but we are, our rights are under fire. Our civil rights are under fire. And these are protected rights. These are protected rights under the, the Constitution. The civil rights movement uh, was fighting for rights that should have been protected under the Constitution, and they were successful. So uh, that's what I would say is it is the obligation of the majority to uphold and fight for the rights of the minority. Yeah. Well, but are, are, are us uh, gun rights advocates, are we really losing? Because um, it seems like things, generally speaking, in the last, what, 20, 30 years have moved in our direction. Yes, but we're still a minority. Um, I, I do agree with you, but we are still a minority. It's a very slow and incremental move towards uh, getting support. And I have quite a number of friends who are supportive of the Second Amendment or supportive of my rights to bear arms, even though they choose not to exercise those rights themselves. They still understand the concept. They understand the need. They understand the importance of it. And that is the challenge there, I think, is, is to get people who are fearful of guns to understand that those of us who are not fearful of guns, who are educated on guns, who know how to use them, uh, we, we are responsible, um, we are caring, we do uh, take our responsibility very, very uh, seriously. Uh, right. We need to get that word out so that we do understand they, would, they should very well be fighting for our rights as well. I want to let yes. Greg jump in here a little bit. Greg, go ahead. Yeah, uh, I, I have a kind of a hands-on approach. I've, I've written this up on the uh, forum before. Um, I always like the idea of actually putting yourself into the community, not carrying your AR, but going out, volunteering for um, any sort of program, um, food for the homeless or uh, toys for tots or even doing a, a church car wash. But Put on some khaki slacks, put on a polo shirt, and strap on your sidearm. And what I find happens is you get to kind of scared looks occasionally, but it gives you a chance to talk to these people. And I've actually had some good conversations with people that started out hostile. And by the time we were done, they understood where I was coming from, why I was doing it, and it made them – it made them realize they had to come to grips with the fact that I was a nice guy, but I still carried a gun. And and if you've got if you just happen to buy a puppy, have that along with you too. Anything that can make their brain have to go through the how could he own a puppy? He's got a gun thing, you know. It gets in their brain and they'll either ask you about it or they'll ask somebody else about it, but it gets the conversation going. And it gives them a situation that they have to resolve that doesn't make any sense. I'm not there shooting people, so why, you know, there must be something wrong with, their, with the thinking. And I, I've always, like I said, I've talked about that a couple of times. I like the active approach, and it, it really it tends to, it's, it's not converting hundreds of people at a time, but every one is a, is a help to our cause. Exactly. Well, we all have to do what we can do. Not everybody is going to be on, on you know, network television. Uh, I, yeah. I, I 100% agree with that. Um, actually, as a, as a rather radical libertarian, uh, I, I've been involved in the peace movement out there with the socialists and all of that. And they know me as a person, you know, a real live person and a nice guy and things like that. Um, matter of fact, they've actually used some of my pictures and videos of their activities on some of their websites. But now, of course, when it comes to guns, we completely disagree. But I think that's the point of getting out there being a real person, not just like this, this guy over there carrying an AR or something like that. I have had some success in getting them to think a little bit and some people to turn around a little bit or at least to respect the gun rights point of view. Yeah, my I issue it, is – go ahead, Greg. I was just going to say, I thought it was an interesting point somebody made that about 45 to 47% of the people are pro-gun. 45 to 47% are anti-gun. And those are not the ones that their minds have changed. We're hitting a very narrow strip 
right in the middle. It's those people who decide every gun vote. It's the people sitting on the fence. It's the people that have the questions that don't know who to ask. So the more we get the word out there that, hey, you know, we're 47 million normal Americans that just happen to own guns. We're not crazy. We're not in the camo up in the mountains practicing to take over the government. This is not who we are. The more they understand the average gun owner, the more likely they are to vote pro-gun when it comes to that moment. Great point. And that leads us to question three. How can we get fence sitters convinced to support our Bill of Rights and the Constitution of the United States? And um, this is something that I've been racking my brain about for several years, going back to when I still lived in New York and when I was a teacher. Um, you know, we can only explain but so much to people that are born or raised, you know, with brain issues. That's the only way I could say it is that they're taught you know, that guns are bad, and anybody who has a gun is a bad person. So let's get this around a little bit. Viking? Well, um, I, I am a believer in uh, setting a good example as a gun owner, as a Second Amendment advocate. Um, I'm not a confrontational person. You know, I'm not a, I'm not a bully of any kind. I, if, I, if anything, I was bullied a long, long time ago. It uh, hasn't, hasn't happened for a long time since then. Um, people need to understand, as you both said, Darren and, and Greg have said, that uh, there are nice people. The majority of them are, are nice people, are reasonable people. Uh, we are safety-minded above and beyond everything else. Um, it's the, the, uh, I just, for lack of a better word, the illegitimate gun owners, the ones that are illegal, uh, you know, felons that have firearms or uh, drug dealers and that sort of thing. Those are the ones where you hear of these accidents happening uh, where, you know, a kid gets a hold of a gun, uh, by and large. I mean, that's not the only time. But, uh, by and large, that's, those are the uh, areas where you'll see um, safety issues where unauthorized people are getting a hold of firearms and people are getting shot or uh, injured and killed. Um, so I try to, you know, say to people, hey, of all of my firearms, not one of them has ever been used in a defensive situation. Not one of them has ever been discharged in a situation uh, that has harmed another human being while in my ownership. They you know, can't speak for some of the war weapons uh, when they were in uh, Korea or in uh, World War One or World War Two. Uh, but in my ownership, uh, none of my guns has ever killed another human being. Um, so you know, people need to understand this. You know, my, my guns have killed fewer people than Tim Kennedy's car. Um, that's that's a, a good argument to take uh, when speaking to people who will question uh, your sanity, your judgment, uh, your your character, uh, what have you. And then also it's important to get people to understand the importance of accepting the Constitution, the Bill of Rights as a whole. Uh, we can't pick and choose which ones we want to uh, uh, accept or the ones that we want to uh, you know, put forth as the, the best of the, our rights. You can pick and choose, however, which ones you choose to exercise. That's an individual choice in the beauty of the Constitution. We can all do that. If you don't want to exercise your, your right to speech, by all means, don't do so. If you don't want to uh, exercise your right to protest, that doesn't mean that we should take away the right to protest in public. It means we should embrace it as a right anybody could use, anybody could exercise on their own. If you don't choose to embrace the Second Amendment, if you don't choose to uh, exercise your right to bear arms, by all means, don't do so. Uh, it, it would probably be foolish if you did. Um, so it, it, it takes a little bit of education. It takes a little bit of effort. I think it's worthwhile, and I think it's a, a battle that we can, we can possibly win, a war that we can possibly win. Okay, great. Oh, yeah. Well, yeah, I, I, I can. I, I, oh. I want to say that you know it's um, basically what what uh, Viking Dad is saying is that it's a it's perspective, and I don't think that people currently have a proper perspective on um, gun ownership. 
uh, everybody, the anti-gun people, the government even has tried to skew um, this type of thinking in that guns are evil, therefore those that own them are evil. Um, and quite frankly, I'll, I'll use something current when this comes up. I'll say, uh, so, um, Malaysia Airlines has killed how many hundreds of people in the last five months? Why is nobody picketing Malaysia Airlines? Why is nobody saying that we've got to take these airlines out of the air? They're killing people by the hundreds. It's happening every month. These things are dangerous. It's got to be stopped. And, of course, everybody rolls their eyes. But the point is, you know, somebody there's a shooting by one crazy person, and he takes out two, three, five people, and all of a sudden it's the guns that have to be targeted. So I usually try to keep people focused on what's real. How many people die from car accidents every year? How many people die from uh, any other cause than guns? And the, the numbers are phenomenal, yet we're targeting this very small minority and a group of people in the United States that has never done anything wrong. As, uh, I mean, as uh, Viking Dad pointed out, they're usually safer than, than other people. They're usually calmer on the road than other people. They, they go out of their way not to inflict violence on somebody else because they have the awesome power and responsibility of carrying that gun. So they, they avoid it at all costs. They take everybody's abuse. They take everybody's hatred. Everybody else needs to unload on them, and they never do a thing about it. And this is the people that we're persecuting. So that's, I, I try and keep it in perspective when – or try and get people, other people to keep it in perspective when they're thinking about guns. Okay, Darren, I think uh, another – I wanted to make a comment afterwards. Uh, yes. Uh, I think – one of the problems is people have too legalistic an approach to to rights. This, the, I've actually had people say the rights, you know, your your legitimate rights are whatever the government decides they are. I've had people say things like that. I've had people say that well, to be moral, you know, it is to abide by the technicalities of the law. And I think that to say well, we have a bill of rights, and to it, to just say that defines rights without having any kind of a concept, a philosophical concept behind it mm-hmm. as to what rights are, is mm-hmm. the problem. Uh, you know, it's again, it's kind of like standing things on or putting the cart before the horse. Let's just put it that way. And that goes back to what I said before: getting people to understand the basis of rights, which to me is that non-aggression principle. You cannot initiate the use of force. And if you start with something basic like that, get people to understand that, that rights are not about what the law says, rights are, rights are a moral concept, I think that might help the cause. Mm-hmm. Well, okay. I, 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 I totally agree with, it, uh, with that. Um, and I just got into a, a fairly long and very uh, uh, civil discussion, surprisingly so, um, on Facebook with uh, some old high school acquaintances uh, one of whom was uh, fighting for the libertarian side. I was, of course, fighting for the. Uh, I'm sorry. One was fighting for the liberal uh, argument and, and saying how liberals, uh, libertarians, need to uh, come over to the liberal side. I'm going to keep using the word myself. Uh, and it's all right. Uh, it, it was actually a really good, uh, really good conversation, and, uh, and very civilly, it was uh, worked out very well. Um, now, the one point that I wanted to make was, um, and I've seen this. Frequently on uh, on our website, on our forum, and I see it frequently uh, in UK Latin, in both Facebook and everywhere else. People people will tend to fight for the rights that they choose to exercise, and they'll discount the rights that they don't choose to exercise. Exactly. So if 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 you are not fighting just as hard for the rights that you don't choose to exercise as you are for the rights that you do, do choose to exercise, you're not fully committed to your own fight. And I think that's a concept that a lot of people really need to work on. Um, if you're going to fight for your right to free speech and you're going to use that right to free speech to fight against my right to bear arms, your right to free speech is being compromised. Your, your fight is being compromised. Your battle is being compromised by what you're saying. 
and that could be carried across to any other uh, any other battle. Um, I mean, it could be you know, the the uh, whole marijuana uh, legality question. If you choose not to smoke marijuana, fine, don't smoke it. I don't smoke it. I don't care to smoke it. I don't want my kids to smoke it. But you know what? I'm not going to tell you that you can't. And I don't think it should be a legal uh, issue. It shouldn't be a government-controlled uh, issue. Uh, it shouldn't be controlled by the government at all. It should be decriminalized. And I'll fight to the death for that right. And it's you know, going back to the old Voltaire saying, I'll, I'll fight to the death for your right to say what you say, even though I disagree with it. But paraphrase, of course. Mm-hmm. Good point. Aaron? Uh, well, yeah, too many people don't understand the importance of principles, and they, 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 they get caught up in that. Uh, they get, let's say they have tunnel vision, and they, they think that, you know, well, if we, we maybe uh, need to implement this or that or the other thing for the greater good, uh, and then they're, they, they, they're willing to trample a few uh, other rights or other people to, to get this whatever. In the case of gun control, that's a good one being implemented for what they see as good. And, of course, no matter how many times things go wrong for them, they just keep on persisting in this. That's the puzzling part. Yeah, that's really what bothers me. Uh, you know, but that leads us to our next question, and we have to say, when is enough enough of compromise? You know, when have we given up? Uh, when have we compromised too much uh, to the other side? That's really the next question. I'm going to flip around. We're going to start with Greg first. Um, well, I guess. Yeah, you lost a little you. bit. Yeah, you, we lost you a little bit, Greg. You picked it up. Can you try to repeat? Oh. Um, I said I I think we're already to the point where we have given up too much. There's. There's been constant compromise only on the gun side. The anti-gunners have pushed and prodded, and they've used their connections to get huge amounts of money, contributed to form groups that trample all over gun ownership, gun usage, um, even self-defense, and it seems like we really don't do an effective job at pushing back. If they don't get 100% of what they want, I've seen gun writers call that a partial win. It's not a partial win. It's a partial loss. That's right. And we have got to stop thinking that we're not in the right. We've got to stop feeling guilty exercising our rights. We've got to stop feeling guilty for owning guns. I mean, other than when I moved into my new house, I called the sheriff's department because that's the law enforcement agency that's in effect where I live. And I told them that I owned firearms and that I wanted to be able to shoot them on my property. I have a couple of acres, and so, you know, I, I didn't want anybody to complain. And he said, okay. And I said, okay. I said, what, what are the rules? And he goes, there aren't any. And I said, well, okay, I just didn't want a neighbor around here to call and, and complain, and you guys have to come out. And he goes, oh, don't, don't complain. But he said, when we come out, we only talk to them. We go to their place, tell them what you're doing is perfectly legal, and, and we can't do anything about it. So he said, when you see our cars in front of your neighbor's houses, that's who called. And uh, I thought it was interesting that I, I was – I went into it being almost apologetic that I wanted to use my guns on my property that I own. And I realized, I, I actually got mad at myself after that. Um, it was probably appropriate to call the sheriff's department to kind of do an introductory thing. But other than knowing what times I can shoot and things like that, I, I really shouldn't be worried about what anybody thinks about it. And I think we need to start taking that to the bigger fights. The, the, we need to start fighting harder for what we know to be right and, and fighting to keep our rights and to actually 
expand our rights rather than just saying, well, we didn't lose 100% of it, so we won. And I guess that's kind of a hard line um, opinion, but uh, it's the one I have to take to put myself in the right frame of mind to go after the people that are trying to take them away. That's yeah. really a very good point. Go ahead, Darren. Defense is a good offense. Um, as far as compromise goes, I think the uh, it's it's easy to get a little bit of tunnel vision and focus on guns and, again, not what's going on around the gun issue. Uh, as I see it, if we accept that the government can, say, confiscate things from us, anything, we've, we have no leg to stand on when we say to them, well, don't confiscate our guns. And I'm, I focus mostly on money for that. I mean, every, most people will accept taxation as a legitimate exercise. And I say, no, if you're, going to, if you're going to allow that theft to happen, you're going to endorse it, let them steal your money. Again, that's a violation of the non-aggression principle. Because taxes are taken by force, the threat of force. Then how do you say, well, okay, you can confiscate my money, but, but don't confiscate my guns. So right there, there's already been a compromise. That Excellent it point. destroys our it destroys our credibility. Right. Another side is another compromise, as I see it, is the acceptance of policing and law enforcement as it exists today. And I'm, I'm sure you guys know that uh, you know you go back to the, the 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 founding era, police forces as we know them didn't exist. You had a constable, a sheriff, something like that, and you had the militia, which was the people. They could be called up when they needed some manpower, but you didn't have these massive police forces. And I would make the argument that policing and law enforcement as it exists today is the standing army that many of the founders warned us not to have. And I think that's another compromise. I'm, as far as I'm concerned, to be pro-gun is to actually be anti-government and anti-police. And if you, if, you, if you give the government the power to take your guns, maybe they'll choose not to exercise that power, but if they have that power, you've already given everything away. And that's why a lot of these sheriffs have uh, joined together in basically denying the government the power to make them uh, take away our rights. Well, I, 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 I have to I have to disagree with that. They're not denying the government the power to take away our rights. They are the power to take away our rights. And just because they choose not to do it doesn't mean the government doesn't have that power. And that's the danger to us, even the good right. sheriff. You know. Yeah, the, the, the right. law enforcement is the mechanism. Uh, it's, it's not it, – I, I don't – I wouldn't say that it's the power. It's the mechanism uh, that they would choose in order to uh, keep our property, uh, whether it – would be money or or firearms or anything else for that matter. Um, now, I don't see it. I don't see it that we have compromised at all. I think we conceded. We conceded far, far too much at this point. Compromise is, is the practice of both sides giving and taking. You both have to concede and you both have to accept concessions. So um, I, I think uh, we've conceded way too much, and I, I, you know, I don't know what the answer is right now. We're clawing back the concessions we've already made, and in California, at least, uh, we're losing ground. We're losing ground very seriously, and as I've said in past, past podcasts, um, we do need to pay very close attention to the fact that political and social trends begin in California and in New York. And for the firearms community, for the Second Amendment uh, uh, advocacy in the United States to concede anything in California or New York is foolish. It's very foolhardy. We can't concede that ground. We can't. We have to stand our ground. And as you know, a, a advocate, I will stand my ground in California as long as I can afford to live here. You know. You know, I agree with that. I guess I'm fortunate that I went from a restricted state in New York to an unrestricted state, uh, being in Arizona. Uh, doesn't mean I don't have um, uh, empathy for uh, you, Viking Dad, or for people in New York, New Jersey, Connecticut, Massachusetts. Um, the, the way things have turned in Virginia, that you've got a, a, an anti-gun governor now in Virginia. You know, I think I just think there are more important things to be worried about 
then how many guns I own or how many guns you own or whether or not our wives and girlfriends know how to shoot. Uh, you know, we worry about those things, but that's our job. As, as That's our job as adults and as heads of household or as partners in a household. Uh, it's not the government's job to worry about whether or not uh, we are uh, constitutionalists, okay? It's the government's job to... Um, it's the government's job to administer to government and to fight wars and to keep us safe uh, from foreign aggression. It's not their job to uh, work internally to uh, take away people's uh, rights, especially the right to keep them bare arms or the right to free speech. That's why when I heard that they put this ruling in the Senate, uh, you know, and in the House to uh, modify the First Amendment, I said, oh, well, this is where it starts. If they can't get one amendment, they'll get another one until they can get the one that, the one that they want to get and line them up in a nice little row and knock them down like dominoes. And, um, again, I want to uh, mention Darren's blog, the International Libertarian at blogspot.com. He does a great job with that. And, um, Darren, I know you have some comments on this, but I also want you to tell us, what have you told your followers, you know, in the recent weeks about uh, some of the confiscations in New York, if you've talked about it, and you've talked about some other stuff, but, you know, I, 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 just, I just feel for everybody that's going through this right now, and I can see if somebody is mentally unstable, they shouldn't have a gun. I don't disagree with that. I disagree with um, somebody's ex-wife, or seems to be ex-wife, going to the sheriff and saying, you know, my estranged husband is dangerous. And, uh, you know, just doing that out of spite uh, to get him locked up or get his uh, possessions confiscated. Um, well, as far as the, uh, uh, as far as the, the ex-wife thing, um, yeah, and the, the speaking of guns, uh, you, and you mentioned New York and what they're doing up there. Uh, one of the, one aspect of that SAFE Act is that the police can preemptively confiscate people's guns if they think that there is reason to think that they'll commit a crime or if they just suspect that they, they're not, they just want to see if there's, if there's been a crime committed. So they actually put that into law that the, the, the police can take right. people's guns. Um, they did, and, and they've already started. They've yeah. already started. There have been cases in Herkimer County. There have been cases in Buffalo. There have been cases in Syracuse County. Uh, there are cases in Delaware County. Uh, at least a half a dozen that we know about. Mhm. So, uh, uh, so uh, the the you the question was what if I told what if I told my followers I read yeah what have you told your followers about this I mean certainly they asked you the question you know well where do we go from here how do we fight this or maybe they don't I don't know. Um, I well I, I've already talked about you know get up make comments do things like that um, right. One of the things that I ran into recently, I'm going to I'm going to plug somebody who is um actually not that pro guns, but I think his research is fantastic for our side. There's a Ohio State University professor by the name of Randolph Ross. And I ran across a a presentation he did. It's about an hour long um with he did it with the National Institute for Justice and his research shows that the the homicide rate, the murder rate, is not about guns. Uh, it's about different social dynamics. So I went out and I got his book called American Homicide. I think he wrote it back in '09, and it, he said that uh, there are four things that are that are important. Political instability drives up the murder rate. Uh, loss of legitimacy of institutions in a country. He says um, if you don't have a, a like a fellow feeling or good feeling about other members in society, whether it's like for racial differences or religious political differences, and uh, also if people don't feel that the social hierarchy is legitimate or fair, or they don't they don't agree with their position in the social hierarchy, these are the things that drive uh, murder, not guns. And I I just think that that's what really knocks down the other side's arguments because they just say, you know, it's the availability of guns, it's the availability of guns, it's the availability of guns. Um, as a matter of fact, recently on June 28th, uh, the, the gun rights haters did a march from uh, a city called Chester, which is in just south of Philadelphia. It's just, it's right. a it's a terrible place. It's lost half of its population since 1950, poor, crime-ridden, with a, with a high murder rate. They did a march from Chester to a place called Media, 
which they're both in the same county. Now, Media is a pretty normal, mid, you know, middle-class, suburban place uh, that hasn't had a single murder since 2005 when they had one. And then before that, they were several years, several years had gone by, many years had gone by before they had one murder in one year. So they're, they're trying to say, well, we, we need gun control, we need uh, universal background checks was their cause this time. Uh, you know, and they're trying to say we need to, to stop the murders in Chester. And I'm like, well, you very conveniently forgot to mention that there's, 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 there almost isn't a murder rate in media where you walked to. So why is it that, you know, if access to guns is the problem, how is it that in Chester they have all these murders and in media they, they, they hardly have any? They have the same access to guns in media as they do in Chester. I mean, to me, they they defeated their own purpose. And I think sometimes we need to learn how to take what they're doing and turn it around on them. You know, and that's a great point. I'm going to, I'm, I'm going to finish that with this before we uh, go to final thoughts and close out. Uh, and again, Darren, we really appreciate you spending some time with us tonight. Uh, I know that uh, you're on the East Coast, so you're three hours ahead of us, so it's pretty late for you. So we uh, really thank you again for spending some time with us. And um, I will make sure you get the link to this to put it up on your site. Uh, you know, I'm, I live in a small town now. I grew up in a big city, all right? I grew up in New York City, uh, which now has a population of almost 9 million when I was growing up. It was a little over 8 uh, as part of a state with nearly 20 million people in it. And uh, I went completely opposite after spending nine years on Long Island where uh, it was um, much more um, working middle class, upper middle class, and there was a lot less... Um, violent crime, and there was a lot more uh, victimless crime, I'll say, um, to here in Arizona where um, everybody lives together. Uh, there, is no, uh, there, there is no racism here uh, for me to speak of, for me to find. Um, everybody here uh, is very uh, polite and kind to each other, and I always believe that you know an armed society is a polite society. And you ask any woman uh, over the age of 40 in this town, and they're going to tell you either their husband has a gun or they have a gun. Okay, and the reason is because they're going to protect themselves because we we live at least 10 minutes away from the nearest policeman. You know, whenever there's an emergency, and we call for a cop. Uh, we have to be lucky that, uh, you know, we have cops that are off duty with scanners that uh, if something goes down and they're not on duty, they hear it and they come anyway. And, uh, you know, we've got uh, three cops that live right here in my development, and uh, only one of them is for our local town. The other two work in the town surrounding us. But if something happens, they hear in three minutes because, you know, they know the county, county sheriff's deputies are 20 minutes away sometimes. And um, so I guess in closing here, uh, we're going to be uh, we're going to be finishing up here real quickly. I just I did want to mention um, there was today uh, in Darby, Pennsylvania, uh, at a hospital there, a psychiatrist who was grazed by gunfire from a patient of his, pulled um, his own gun. He's a concealed carry, pulled uh, his own gun and uh, shot and subdued the. Uh, the perpetrator, um, unfortunately, a uh, uh, orderly or somebody working at the hospital was also shot and was killed, a uh, 53-year-old caseworker. Um, however, uh, had that doctor not been carrying his sidearm in the, on hospital grounds uh, in defiance of the no-guns policy, that could have been a much, much more tragic uh, situation there. Uh, he could have gone walking down the, wall, the hallways, unloading all his uh, uh, ammunition. He apparently, I think, had two guns, according to the story. It's a little bit unclear. He had at least one. Um, it was more tragic. Uh, so, you know, here's a doctor uh, who defied the no-guns policy on hospital grounds and uh, arguably saved uh, a number of lives in doing so, uh, his, his own being one. Uh, he was shot and wounded. So. It is worth mentioning. I'm glad you brought it up, Mike, because if you didn't, I would have. Um, you know, before we uh, do the actual closeout, I want to uh, bring this point up also. Um, there are a lot of people here in Arizona 
that applauded uh, Governor Brewer when she um, signed into effect the bill turning into a law that put uh, policemen back in the schools, uh, not just in high schools, in all the schools. There is now a school resource officer or a patrolman who is trained in school resources in every school, at least one in every school in Arizona. And here our local high school serves 1,000 kids in the county, in the northern part of the county here. And um, we have three officers. We have a sergeant and we have two patrolmen, uh, you know, uh, one from the city, one from, and two officers from the county. Uh, two deputies. So it is something that's taken very seriously here. And, um, you know, up the hill from me, uh, we have a small town that used to be a mining town that only has about 6,000 people in it, and they only have eight policemen, uh, and they have somebody in the school every day, in the school, in the, in the elementary school. I think it's really, really important. Um, my niece is a teacher, but I'm a retired teacher. My niece is a teacher back east on Long Island, and uh, her district on Long Island is going to be the first one that allows teachers to um, be licensed and carry a firearm. And uh, I think it was really funny because my niece asked me, you know, in, a, in, a, in an email, you know, she said to me, well, what should I get? Because I'm going to start this training in October. What should I get? And I said, do you remember firing your grandpa's, my father, my father-in-law, who's a New York City policeman, do you remember firing grandpa's 38? And she said, I do, but I was like eight years old. You know, I'm 26 now. I said, I think you'd be just fine with a five or six shot revolver because you're not, um, you're not a police person, you're not a police woman, you're a teacher. And it's only going to be drawn in an emergency. I said, and, you know, the next time your uncle, one of your other uncles is, is over there and, you know, uh, she has an uncle in Pennsylvania where you are, Darren, um, and her sister and brother-in-law are there as well, uh, you know, she'll get some training. And I've given her names of a couple of people on Long Island that can help her out. Um, you know, I just think it's a good thing all around. It's a smart thing. It would, it would uh, cure so many societal ills, even if it doesn't address the problem of getting these people uh, with mental lapses help. It makes them realize that uh, they're not going to survive or not take down any people, any kids that they go into a school and try to shoot it up. They're going to need an armed resistance. And uh, Greg, I want to give you a shot to open with final thoughts. I'm going to give Darren an opportunity to promote his blog one more time, and then we'll do it comes out. So, Greg? Well, you know, it was funny because when we were talking about uh, this, the um, quote from uh, Martin Niemöller, came to mind. He was a uh, pastor who was uh, interned in a concentration camp by the uh, Nazis uh, during World War II. And uh, he's the one that wrote, um, first they came for the socialists and I did not speak out because I was not yes. a socialist. Then they came for the trade unionists and I did not speak out because I was not a trade unionist. Then they came for the Jews and I did not speak out because I was not a Jew. Then they came for me, and there was no one left to speak for me. And I think we need to remember that when we're fighting so hard for gun rights, we need to look beyond that and see what other rights are being violated and kind of expand our activism to include anybody's rights that are being put down in hopes that when they come after us, we'll get the same courtesy from the people that we helped. I agree with that. Darren? Yes, I agree 100%. Liberty is a package. It, 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 you, you either accept liberty or, you know, or the idea of rights or you don't. And if you, you, you have to respect all of them or you're really respecting none. Uh, uh, you want me to promote my blog? I'll always have Please to do, do. that. Please do. So the International Libertarian, uh, the, the, the URL is uh, the International Libertarian.blogspot.com. Uh, just a quick word about why I call myself the International Libertarian um, and how that relates to guns. I grew up in uh, Puerto Rico, Puerto Rico. Okay. Which has a very uh, high murder rate. Um, not as many guns as on the, in, the, in the U.S. Um, later on in life, I, I spent eight years, I lived in Venezuela. And um, 
over there, their murder rate is astronomical. Uh, more recently, they've come in as like the second highest murder rate in the entire world. Um, but even when I was there in the 90s, the murder rate was much higher than the U.S.'s, and they're, you know, they have stricter gun control. They have fewer guns in society. Um, and then there's my wife, uh, who is from Guyana. It's is in South America, right next to, uh, to Venezuela. It used to be British mm -hmm. Guyana. So they inherited, I guess, some of the uh, British gun control. Well, their murder rate is four or five times higher than the United States. Yet they don't have guns. I've been there three times. Their capital city is called Georgetown. You don't hear gunfire mm -hmm. in the night, but yet they're killing, they're, they're, their murder rate is, is much higher than ours. So, you know, I think anybody with any experience, you know, stepping foot outside of the United States should be able to tell that, you know, getting rid of guns or making having fewer guns around isn't the solution. If anything, it can aggravate things. You know, and it's funny you brought up Puerto Rico because I've been there twice. I have an aunt. Um, I have an aunt who is uh, uh, a Latin Jew and lives in Puerto Rico. Uh, eight out of eight out of the twelve months of the year, and um, you know, it's really funny because all my all my cousins by marriage down there are all law-abiding citizens. They're they're in the IDPA club that was uh, recently uh, featured on. Um, one of the shows on the Outdoor Channel because I actually <laughs> saw two of my distant cousins shooting in that match. <laughs> you know, so it's really funny because um, you know it doesn't matter where you go. And uh, I've been all over Central America as a soldier um, in service to our country. I've been there three times. I've been to Honduras. I've been to El Salvador. I've been to Panama twice. Uh, I've been to Costa Rica. Um, I've been to Mexico. Uh, and I find that the as bad as the crime rate is in New York or Chicago or L.A. or um, parts of Oakland that uh, I know Mikey can uh, attest to being in the Bay Area, uh, I've never seen anything like I've seen in Mexico City. All right, when we were down there uh, training uh, with the federales, uh, my unit, uh, when we were training with the federales and the DEA. And that was a long time ago. That was in the mid-'80s. And, um, you know, I find that... Um, I find some of the stuff that goes down there horrifying. People shrug their shoulders and say, this is the way it is. Everything is not the way it is, you know, back home in, in America. And, um, you know, I think people don't realize how lucky we are to have the rights we are. And I'm going to give Viking Dad the last word tonight because we are right up against the end of the show. So you have 90 seconds, my friend. <laughs> Well, and um, I can't uh, begin to emphasize enough, uh, get out there, be active, uh, speak up, speak out, uh, be respectful, uh, be courteous, be kind, and try and get the word out there that uh, we are, uh, as a whole, a group, um, all the same. Uh, and we need support of non-gun owners uh, as desperately as we can possibly use the, the support of gun owners. Uh, as uh, uh, pointed out earlier, uh, it, it's a small percentage of people who are kind of on the fence, so to speak, and it's those people who we rely upon in order to uh, regain our rights that we've lost and in order to reinforce the rights that we have, that we still have. We will be able to regain some of those rights here in California, back in New York, and uh, other states in the East Coast. So, uh, terrific uh, show. Uh, uh, it was a pleasure having you, Darren. Thank you for joining us. Absolutely, Darren. Thanks so much. And um, we're going to be OUT out in about five seconds, folks. Thank you so much, and a very, very good night to you all. And that's going to be it.